So it's been 14 days since I got the iPhone 15 Pro. Do I have any regrets? And most importantly, am I gonna miss my old iPhone 13 Pro? When you first decide which phone you're going to buy, you've obviously got to decide which color you're going for. Now, I obviously went for the blue titanium. To be honest with you, none of the other colors intrigued me. My favorite color is blue, and that's simply why I chose it. It was also actually the reason why I chose the Sierra blue version on the iPhone 13 Pro. I've seen the reports about some iPhone 15 Pros being discolored out of the box, but thankfully for me, mine was fine. And as what I do with all of my phones, as soon as I get them, I get a case on it straight away. Protection is the first and foremost, the most important thing for me when it comes to getting a new phone. But the downside to many cases these days is that apart from the transparent ones, you pop a case on your phone to protect it. The case stays on your phone for two, three, four years, and you never see your phone without a case on again until it's time to sell it, pass it on, and sometimes by that time you've completely forgotten that you've bought the blue titanium iPhone. So in that respect, if you've got a case to put on your phone, does it matter what color you've got? I actually did it this week with my iPhone 13 Pro. I took it out of the case to package it away for trading and I'd completely forgotten that I chose the lovely Sierra Blue iPhone. And the benefit of that though is that I'm effectively trading in a pristine looking phone that has hardly any scratches on the stainless steel, which could still be cleaned to be as shiny as the day I first opened it. And it hasn't even got a fault on the back glass or the display screen, which had also been covered with a screen protector. Now I'm jealous of that lucky person that may end up with that iPhone 13 Pro. And the new titanium frame finish, although much better at dealing with fingerprints compared to the stainless steel frame of the previous iPhones, they're still present, but the usual wipe away clears them off. It'd be interesting to see whether the paler iPhone 15 Pro colors deal with the visibility of fingerprints better than the darker shades. This year, I was going to get the Pro Max, but due to website issues and availability, I stuck with the smaller Pro size. I think in truth, the Pro Max would have probably just been a little bit too big, although I'm sure holding the phone and using it daily would have not been a problem. But what about those times when you're not using it? Where's it going? Your pockets. Most men's trousers and jeans should be okay to accommodate a phone of the size of the Pro Max, but there'll be occasions where it just won't Fit. I'm currently doing a lot of running at the moment and I've had to buy running shorts with zipped pockets that are big enough to accommodate this phone, this being 6.1 inches, and not many actually do. Imagine having to deal with the Pro Max while running. I'm happy with this Pro size, it's smaller and lighter compared to the Pro Max and thanks to its titanium build, which makes it the joint lightest Pro named iPhone and thankfully those curved edges make holding this phone so much more comfortable than the previous iPhone, which was always going to be a negative with those straighter, sharper edges. I was asked recently, what's your new phone like? I had to stop and think, what is it actually like? Apart from having a new phone that has better cameras and new design tweaks and some other extra features, my day-to-day -day use of the phone is exactly the same. And I suppose that's what happens when you have an iPhone and you set up your new phone by syncing it from the old phone. I've been using iOS 17 ever since the beta version came out and was available to the public. So the iOS, which was developed and optimized for use on this phone, I've been using already for months, so nothing's changed. Apart from the obvious noticeable differences when you do get a new phone with the newly designed chips, it works better as it's more optimized to the latest software and generally runs quicker and smoother. But apart from that, that's it. The average user won't notice the 10% improvement in CPU performance and the 20% in GPU performance of the A17 Pro chip over the A16 Bionic, which was in last year's Pro models and features in this year's non-Pro models. But what they may notice if they've upgraded from older iPhone generations is that apps, games, and tasks are generally running faster and smoother than before. One of those things that we just take for granted because it's, it should just work and that's what newer phones do. They're just, they're always quicker anyway. But wait until we start playing those AAA games. Then hopefully if we believe what Apple is saying, then this should be where the A17 Pro chip comes into its own. While the phrase is same old Apple and nothing ever changes keep cropping up, especially from those often critical about Apple devices and the efficiency of the ecosystem as a whole, those people class that as a negative mark in the box of Apple, but that's fine. That's what I like, the familiarity that you get from moving on from one iPhone to another. I've always been a little bit hit and miss on the cameras of iPhones. Videos, hands down for me, are probably the best on any smartphone, but photos, there always just seems to be phones out there that are able to take better looking 
taking photos. But this year, I actually like the photos that are coming out of the main camera. I'm enjoying that the 15 Pro can shoot in 24 pixels by default, which is already twice the resolution that the 13 Pro was able to shoot in, meaning that photos produced by the main camera lens will have more detail and clarity, and you'll be able to crop in closer without losing quality, which is notoriously been one of the historical drawbacks of iPhone photography. And with it also being able to shoot at 48 megapixels on the main camera at 1x and not in a mode that is night flash or macro mode, which will still be shot and saved at 12 megapixels, you'll be able to save them with those Pro Raw or high files. So they're going to be able to give you more detail and flexibility for your editing. I'm still not a fan of the whole night mode. Although the main camera can capture more detail, the quality of the whole night mode for me is let down by the quality of the other lenses, which diminish the quality of the picture. I sort of hope one day that Apple would make the quality and resolution of the other lenses as good as the main camera lens. My favorite camera feature though is those improvements in the portrait mode. It seems that Apple have refined their system of edge detection in not only people, but in your pets too. And you don't even have to be in the dedicated portrait mode to do it either, as long as the setting and focus on the subject is correct, then the lens is automatically going to be capturing that depth information that is going to be able to create that portrait image with that added blur background effect that can be further modified after you've taken a photo. As you can see here, I've got a photo of my cat and I've not quite got her in focus, but in the past, that's a wasted photo. But now, as long as the photo has that depth information, I can refocus on the correct part and now I fix the photo. With this photo as well, you're able to see the benefits of that higher dynamic range and that new smart HDR feature that preserves more of the details in the highlights and the shadows of your photo. Previously, where there would have been no way out that I'd be able to see so much detail zooming in on my black cat, her fur and features just tended to all merge into one, particularly in this photo where the conditions weren't the best, you can still see those details. There are many more features of this camera system that I haven't had a chance to delve into yet, but I am looking forward to filming in log and seeing just how close I can get the footage coming out of this phone to look like the footage out of my ZV-10. But stay tuned to the channel for those videos. The action button, whether you like the mute switch or not, the move to a physical button was an important one for Apple, giving the users the flexibility to be able to customize, which is something iPhone users don't get to say a lot, but increase are being able to do more these days. What that action button does, although refined to eight categories, it's what you can do with those categories, which is the best part. The interface where you can customize what the action button does is so different to anything else on the iPhone, but that's a good thing. And I hope we see more things like this in the future. I've currently got the action button set to open the camera, but as a further customization, if you find yourself wanting the press of the action button to go to a particular mode within that category, then you can select that too. Because I'm liking portrait mode so much at the moment, I've got the action button set to start the camera in portrait mode when I press it. So those extra seconds saved mean that I've got more chance of getting that shot that I want. There will still be people out there that use the action button on the phone as much as they use the mute switch, almost never. I was that person. My phone permanently stayed on silent and I basically never used the switch. But this action button has now given me the reason to start interacting with this part of the phone again. If you've got an iPhone 15 Pro, what have you mapped your action button to? Or is it still your toggle for silent mode? Every year we're promised better battery life in the new phones, but this year, although the phones may be more efficient with that A17 Pro chip, it doesn't seem like the battery life is any different from last year's phone, which was one of the main issues with the phones last year. Maybe they have improved the battery, but the A17 Pro chip is a bit more power hungry, therefore leaving a net effect on battery life as the same as last year. Will the majority of average users still probably get a day's usage out of this? Probably. I mean, I use it a lot, not for power hungry tasks, but for general tasks that most people are doing, surfing the internet, checking social media, watching videos, and I'm still ending the day at about 30% left. I charge the phone when I go to bed using the optimized battery charging, and as long as it's 100% when I wake up, that's fine. A recent iOS update seems to have improved the warming issue that some people were having on their Pro models, and this seems to have also improved the battery life as well. But we'll see over the course of the phone's life whether they will actually suffer from the same battery health and maximum capacity issues that the iPhone 14 Pros did. I was impressed when the Dynamic Island was first introduced, but now using it a year later, I'm frustrated because there's only a few select apps that I use daily that take advantage of this, which limits its overall usefulness and potential. It will sometimes interfere with the status bar icons or the app content, making them hard to see or access and 
at the moment doesn't offer much customization options for those who just simply want to change the way it looks. But it's not all negatives because it replaced that notch, which was annoying and distracting. And while I said customization was one of the negatives, it has offered a new way of accessing, controlling the different features and functions of the phone, such as tapping or long pressing the island to expand, dismiss, or interact with certain content. Some users may love it, some may hate it, and some may not even care about it at all. But the Dynamic Island is a novel and innovative feature that adds some value and convenience to the iOS experience. But it does have drawbacks and limitations that need to be improved, and I'm sure Apple will do that over time. When you've been used to a phone with no always on display, it takes some time to get used to Apple's version of the always on display without getting distracted and thinking that you've either got a notification or left the screen on. I definitely prefer the always on display without the wallpaper coming up just to reduce those distractions, allow me to be able to just glance at the phone without having to unlock it. I'm sure we all know why Apple moved the iPhone over to USB-C, and of course it's a significant development. But do you think Apple would have made this move without those EU guidelines? Let me know what you think in the comments below. For some, this change is gonna be inconvenient. That transition from Lightning to USB-C now means having to replace your existing Lightning accessories like charging cables, docks, just to accommodate the new port. But isn't disposing of the old Lightning accessories creating that exact e-waste they were hoping to avoid? Yes, moving iPhones to USB-C is slowly unifying Apple's device lineup. And yes, doing this means that most people are gonna be now be able to use the single cable to charge their iPhones, Macs, iPads, and non-Apple products, essentially simplifying the process. But what about those people who still have Lightning accessories? For me, I've got a 2017 iPad Pro and the first generation AirPods Pro, both of which still use Lightning. And I won't be updating these two until their time is up. So for me, I've still got a need for the Lightning cable. And now I'm having to carry two cables around, the Lightning and the USB-C cable. Ever since MagSafe was introduced on the iPhone 12 series for me, this has significantly shifted iPhone charging from the port to the wireless charging puck. I very rarely ever charge my iPhone wired because the MagSafe charger is usually more convenient and my regular nighttime charger is MagSafe compatible and charges wirelessly too. But I must admit, where the USB-C port has come into its own for me is data transfer. Plugging this into my Mac mini, I'm able to transfer high-res videos and those large, file photos much quicker compared to via lightning or airdrop. And when filming those videos, I'm able to record straight to an external drive. So for those two things alone, USB-C gets a thumbs up for me. Well done Apple for finally seeing the light, even if it was sort of forced. So that's been my first two weeks and thoughts of the new iPhone 15 Pro following my upgrade from the iPhone 13 Pro. I have to say, so far it's been definitely a worthwhile upgrade. It has a stunning 6.1 inch Super Retina XDR display, the Power 4A17 Pro chip, the camera system, and the slightly refreshed sleek design with that titanium frame. But don't just take my word for it, stay tuned to the channel for more videos where I'll show you some of the coolest features and tips of the iPhone 15 Pro. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to get notified when I upload new videos. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about the iPhone 15 Pro. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.